Hey folks, Rob Potter here. This is my first uh, podcast on the victory of the light with Dr. Raymond Keller after my Mount Shasta summer conference. Uh, of course, we have the beautiful, wonderful uh, wizard of cause, as I'd like to call him. Raymond, how are you Good. doing today? Good, Rob. Thank you so much. Hey, I'm going to bring up the website real quick, folks. So we had a the conference was fantastic. Uh, I may be sharing uh, some photos here that we have um, uh, real quick, but uh, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone who came to the conference and especially all my speakers. Of course, the guests are what really make it. We had some amazing uh, talks and experiences there. So I'm going to share a screen real quick here and we're going to get uh, right to uh, my website real quick. So you'll notice here that we're having uh Raymond and I are going to be in Glastonbury. Uh, we're actually going to be there uh, a little before the 10th of August. Uh, we're doing, it's actually going to start at 9.30. We changed the time on that. But if you're interested, if you're in England, if you know anyone who might want to come, um, uh, please do uh, check out this uh, conference in Glastonbury. Of course, my website, we got the truth references. So here's a, here's a Glastonbury. This is based on Dr. Raymond's book. Um, I'm doing, uh, Raymond and I are both going to be at the Portal to Ascension in Glastonbury, England. But before that, I think we're arriving around the, the 7th, and we're going to be doing a book opening either on the 8th or the 9th um, at a place called Figaro de Montmartre, a beautiful uh, couple from uh, France, and I, I believe he's from Italy. But uh, they're musicians and they have a beautiful clothing store with lots of different things. So here it is. You can click and you can read about the Portal to Ascension with Neil Gower. Uh, and then ours is only $100 for a full day in Glastonbury. Uh, this will allow you to purchase. It gives the address there. If you'd like to read my introduction to Raymond's Gospel that d describes how he was chosen by the angel force or the ministry of angels, as I like to call them, as a chosen messenger to use a very special technology. This is about the youth gospel of Jesus, where we find out that Thomas Didymus, the twin, was Jesus's twin brother, and how the church that kept that out of the mainstream was quite a, quite a feat there. And they also uh, kept out the fact that this little snippet of the gospel of Mary Magdalene um, that he was married with two children at the time of the crucifixion, and the third child was born probably in France um, after his uh, uh, passing. So we see here 810, uh, it says 9 to 5. I'm going to actually change that to 930. But this is a, a beautiful uh, uh, little uh, information here. Uh, actually, this is supposed to be changed. I don't know why I didn't keep that, but it's actually in Chickwell Street. It's only 80 pounds, uh, which is $100. At the door, it's going to be a, a tad more. So uh, Raymond was given uh, the ability to um, use the breastplate of Aaron, uh, which was used to determine and receive information from the from the angels or the heavenly forces um, by wearing the breastplate of Aaron. And he was given a pair of glasses that were used by Joseph Smith, who wrote the book, The Latter-day Saints. And <clears throat> these glasses allowed Raymond to look into the past. Um, Cause why don't you tell him briefly how that worked a little bit? You were able to- Oh, look sure. At it's the- uh, yeah. uh, Sear stone connected to a breastplate, and it kind of looked like um, World War I uh, uh, goggles for pilots, what it, it looks like on the on the outside. But it's the, the stone, the sear stone, uh, the orum and thummim, the sear and revelator, and uh, was given to me for a short time to provide the translation of the Gospels of Thomas and Mary Magdalene. So there are three there are three Gospels by Thomas, the Youth Gospel, um, Thomas's mission in uh, India, and then um, the Gospel that he wrote about the esoteric teachings of, of Jesus. And then, of course, Mary Magdalene's Gospel, written by her, uh, stands, stands alone. Um, but 
there's a connection there with the writings of uh, the the writings of Thomas that lead right into the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. So when Rob and I go there, um, there's various uh, paranormal research groups in the the British Isles that have received invitations for their members to get in at uh, at half price. So um, some of these are anomaly researchers, uh, the British Earth and Aerial Mysteries Society, the Birmingham UFO Group, uh, the Bolton UFO Society, British UFO Research Association, or BUFORA, Contact International, Cornwall UFO Research Group, Exopolitics, UK, London UFO Studies, um, uh, Lenchestyer Unidentified Flying Object Investigation Network, Nottingham Skywatch, Plymouth UFO Research, South End UFO Group, and Strange Phenomena Investigations, as well as Wakefield UFO Research and Investigations, and Welsh UFO Research Network. So if you're a member of any of those groups, um, Please check with your um, organization directorate uh, to get more information and uh, just identify yourself as a member of that U a UFO or paranormal research anomaly group and we'll um, um, let you in at uh, half half off. Okay, cause you were pretty tricky there. He goes around all the, the the good stuff there, and yes, of course, get a hold of them, or you just go directly to my website, and uh, we'll honor the price when you uh, uh, show up at the door. You can pay at the door, give me a call, and we'll figure that out. <clears throat> so, Raymond, so you had these these three things. Uh, so we're talking about the Acts of Thomas, the Gospel of Thomas, uh, and of course, um, the Youth Gospel of Jesus and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Can you tell us um, uh, how how these worked? You were able to look at a, a transcript, and you were able to look into a bilocation signal in what the Christians would call the Book of Life, or we would call the Akashic Records, where you're actually able to see things in the past. Is that correct? Yes. So the the Gospels in their original text are fragmented, and there's a lot of missing information. And through the um, through the um, gift of God and having the uh, having these instruments, I was able to um, see in the mind's eye exactly what was happening in in those missing spaces or lacunas, as they're called by textual analysts, and uh, and report uh, the uh, accurate uh, record of of uh, Thomas and Mary Magdalene. Okay, you know you're no stranger to to great metaphysical uh, feats on Venus when you lived there for two and a half months. You're able to look into the past. We're going to do some other uh, things here, folks. But I just wanted to pump up this Gospel of Thomas. This is a supernatural gift, and you'll read in my. Um, introduction to this gospel if you choose to go and look at it for those of you who are christians or uh follow the teachings of christ uh, which are really universal teachings <clears throat> it's important that we recognize all religions and their spiritual import and the message uh so let's go back i'm gonna let's just say let's go back to where thomas is down by the river uh or down yeah about by the river or the lake or whatever the stream and uh Describe what you're what you're seeing here. Uh, I guess it was uh, Annas, one of Jesus's great opponents throughout his life. Um, his son had the same type of bullying instincts. Just kind of share in the youth gospel uh, the time that Jesus first raised someone from the dead and how that occurred. Now you're looking into the past. You can look around. I asked him. He said he could look around, like when you were at Peter's place down by the Sea of Genesaret, you could see his house by the shore, his fishing tackle, and all disciples. Can you just give us a, a little snippet of, you must have had... Oh, sure. Um, 
I don't have it uh, right in front of me. I can go. I, I you can have go. your memory, Cos. Oh, oh, okay. Well, um, <clears throat> it begins with um, uh, Jesus and Thomas. They're at uh, a river bank and um, uh, outside their home in Nazareth. And um, they are uh, uh, attending to a, a, a bird that was struggling in a ford in the river. And um, I had a broken wing and Jesus heals the little bird. And um, then um, in the process of doing that, the local rabbi um, sees what's going on and his son is also there. And uh, uh, they get in a little scuffle uh, and uh, the rabbi is accusing uh, Jesus of of uh, and Thomas of uh, uh, not observing the Sabbath day. And uh, so what happens is that um, that uh, 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 well, in in the first chapter, then uh, uh, and Jesus and Thomas, uh, the bullies are trying to get Thomas and so uh, uh, get Jesus and Thomas, his brother, kind of on instructions of Mary to uh, his mother to uh, protect Jesus, pushes the bully down into some oleanders and he has allergic reaction. And uh, Annas yells at Joseph and at Jesus and kind of makes a scene. The next time the bully comes up and uh, starts uh, muddying the waters and uh, Thomas is not so quick to react. And the bully uh, does what, Raymond? He raises a stick to Jesus. Oh, yeah. oh. Oh, oh, yes. And, um, well, it doesn't go too well for him. And um, um, he drops he, dead. He, yeah, he, he, he drops dead. But uh, <laughs> I'll have to uh, I'll have to get the uh, get the book to to, um, you know, check. I'll tell you what happened, Cos. OK, so Cos. Okay. Okay. What happens? There's so many. There's a, there's a couple hundred chapters throughout that uh, that whole book, and and so what happens is is this little boy, this bully, in the second encounter, drops dead, and everyone's freaking out, and they run over, and Jesus's father is called, and Annas's father is called, and now do you remember what happened, Cos, or do you want me to tell? It? Yeah, go 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 ahead. While you're doing that, I'm going to go actually go get the book because no, no, it's okay, cause I want to go into what you want to go into next. So, um, anyway, so what happens is is they're going and Jesus and they're like, oh my God, he's you know Anna's going, he's my killed the son, and everyone's coming over and they're going, oh my God, this kid's got some serious powers. No one should go against him, and and uh, he says um, the kid drops dead. And then Jesus says, no, he's just sleeping. And he, and he says, I don't know what his name was or whatever, or if he actually said this, he said, bully boy or something. Hey, bully boy, wake up. And he gets up. So uh, Annas goes off in a huff that this irreverent little child um, at seven years old has struck his, his son. So Jesus was a very unique incarnation. And, um, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, most of you know me. I'm not religious in any way. I don't believe in any religious dogma or any of the uh, the false narrative of Jesus as the um, the only Son of God or the only Avatar of Truth. There are many, and all religions have come forward. Many people want to claim this egotistical idea that uh, Jesus was unique. He was the Venusians consider him the living word of God made flesh. In other words, the, reflect, the highest reflection of the creator of this universe, who the Venusians call the father of lights, uh, reflected in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. So um, 
I'm not a Jesus freak. I don't want to jam Jesus down your throat or defend all the wars that have been held in the name of Christ and all the judgment, all the bigotry, all the hatred. And it's time that we come to understand the universal Christ. So I'm going to let that go a little bit. But you folks want to come and hear some amazing stories. Uh, you might want to mention to some people to come to Glastonbury, England. Okay, cause. So now uh, Raymond recently just got back from a time where he was in, uh, I think it was Cranberry, New Jersey, uh, where there he took, they were supposed to have a special day uh, in Highbridge, New Jersey, with the famous um, uh, contactee, who was actually from a moon of Saturn called Sol Denaro, who had a love affair before his incarnation on Earth with a with a uh, a woman from Venus, and she eventually incarnated and became his second wife. Her name was Connie Menger, Howard and Connie Menger. I'm going to bring up those pictures uh, real quick. Or do you have the PowerPoint ready? Um, yes, I have the PowerPoint ready, and um, um, this is based on more detailed information uh, that's in the book Venus Rising. And um, if um, if you um, are watching oh. podcasts regularly in the next um, in the next few weeks, we'll be covering book one highlights out of book one, book two, and book three the initial trilogy of the Venus uh, Rising series. And um, we're going to offer a special on that for $50. Also, folks, yeah, for all, for all the, three of them. And folks, I think you have, Raymond has nine books on Venus now. He's cranked out nine books since 2015. So Raymond is, is quite a prolific researcher, and we're going to be offering all those books Nine times 20 is 180. We're including shipping for all nine books, including the Gospel of Thomas. And you can see them on my website. We have uh, Venus Rising. Uh, and then we have the Rockets to Venus, which decries all of the lies of NASA on the fact of how life can exist on Venus. We have Cosmic Ray's e Excellent Adventure, his trip to Venus, uh, and some other amazing stuff. And then we have... Uh, Lady Columba, Venus Revelations, written by the Venusian, who time-traveled into a future parallel Earth. So much metaphysical information. A flying saucer from Venus, they come. Uh, vast Venus conspiracy. Uh, the Gospel of Thomas. A new book uh, called Paranormal. Uh, West Virginia Paranormal Gateway, uh, which includes the true story of Sister Thedra, who is from Charleston, West Virginia, born there in 1902, but later uh, lived in Peru with George Hunt Williamson in Sedona and Mount Chasta, and um, was the initial prophetess who revealed the existence of the cloud ships that you see around Mount Chasta all the time. Right. So, so this is coming up in the next thing. So I'm going to let Raymond take over the story of Howard Menger who was having contacts in the 40s with the Venusians. He was one of the first primary contact and having a lot of experiences of the famous picture of Valiant Thor. Um, we're taking, uh, and I'll, uh, Kaz, go ahead. He's got a PowerPoint for us. I'm going to go on mute and turn off the video real quick while Kaz does this, and I'll come in. Okay, so okay. folks... Here is the epic sour story of Howard Menger. There's, of course, my buddy whom I met, Valiant Thor, in 2003. Okay, this is the epic story of Howard Menger and the Venusian, known as Valiant Thor, the Victor One spaceship commander. And um, it, this was presented um, for the first time at uh, the Cranberry Inn uh, last Saturday in uh, Cranberry, New Jersey. And uh, the, the, as Rob said, the program was originally going to be held in Highbridge, New Jersey, uh, Howard's hometown, as sponsored by the, um, by the uh, Highbridge uh, uh, Borough, uh, Borough Council, City Council there. Uh, but they didn't have enough... Uh, of a response to go through with it and that other local 
East Coast uh, UFO groups were also going to be there uh, uh, with me. So this was uh, thanks to uh, K um, Karen Wallow, an entertainer and artist in New uh, Central New Jersey. Um, she was able to get the venue of the Cranberry Inn where we could present this um, uh, PowerPoint. Okay, so um, how did I get all this information that you're about to see? Uh, as the, the editor of the Flying Saucer Report back in, in the uh, mid-1960s, I corresponded with many of the people involved with, with Howard Menger, like Gray Barker, Otto Binder, uh, Howard and Connie themselves, Dominic Lucchesi, August C. Roberts, and Dr. Frankie Stranges, exchanging publications and, and uh, information with them. Uh, here's an article from uh, Gray Barker's file from uh, uh, the 1969 issue of the National Enquirer, which featured myself, you see in the upper right of the newspaper article uh, with a, 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 a photo similar to a UFO that I encountered over a railroad trestle in Walton Hills, Ohio, that got me started. And then holding up back issues of the Flying Saucer Report with the co-editor, Alan Weston, um, in, the middle, um, in the middle. So um, this is where this information came from. And uh, I held on to it for, for, the, um, uh, for the longest time. And, um, I'm slowly revealing the information that I have in various UFO books and uh, books in the Venus Rising series. And um, I don't know if the, I'll be on Earth for enough time to, uh, uh, to finish them all and get through all the information, but I'm certainly going to try. <clears throat> so a little bit about uh, <clears throat> Howard Menger. He was born on the 17th of February, 1922 in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, but he, he was raised on a farm in the rural borough of Highbridge, New Jersey, situated in the northwestern part of the state, where there's a lot of UFO sightings even today up around Wanakee Reservoir. And there were even recent reports in Highbridge itself uh, of late of UFOs coming down and landing uh, in the area. So Howard and his younger brother, Alton, who was four years younger than him, uh, would frequently go out into the rural countryside out by the lake with friends, and uh, he enjoyed a carefree yet energetic youth. So th this is what uh, Highbridge looked like back in the, back in the uh, uh, 1920s. You see that they didn't uh, yet have electrification, the streets were not paved, but it was a peaceful setting right out of, um, right out of uh, a novel from around the time, you know, like when The Great Gatsby was written, of rural America. So this is... Um, what year is that, Cos? Th this is uh, in the mid-1920s. Right, so... so uh... That's so so Raymond was born, uh, he's about three or four years old here. And um, it's kind of interesting in the 40s. So he was in his late 20s when he was having his first contacts then, huh? Yes, that's that's right. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. Well, yeah, we'll see about um, <clears throat> the first appearance of flying discs and angels over Highbridge, New Jersey. So when Howard was eight and his little brother was four years old, they began to notice flying disks and other strange objects swooping down out of the sky and hovering over their farm. Their parents also observed some unusual phenomena in the night sky over their apple orchard in the backyard. And while their father was a staunch Catholic and their mother an unyielding Methodist, there's nothing better to bring people of different religious persuasions together than angels flying over their house for some as yet undetermined reason. Hmm. So this is an artist's conception of what uh, 
uh, what Howard and his little brother would see uh, when they would uh, uh, journey into the woods, the wooded area around their home in Highbridge. And you see the typical Venusian spacecraft with the three condensing balls or accumulators, um, illustrative of the fact that um, the scout ships <clears throat> do not need their own motor um, to generate power because the power is free, captured along the magnetic lines of force around the Earth or the powerful mother ships in the upper atmosphere. Uh, and uh, they uh, you know, could take advantage of that. So when Howard was just 10 years old, he caught sight of this beautiful woman um, in a, coming down in a saucer-shaped object like the one we just saw that landed in a wooded area just beyond the Manger family house. Running out to the craft, he spotted a beautiful angelic woman perched on a large rock. The woman identified herself as an inhabitant of Venus and also told Howard not to be afraid for she had come to Earth on a mission of mercy to help humankind. She spoke to him as she would an adult, telling him of past incarnations on other planets and also of his destiny. Howard sensed that pure love emanated from this beautiful angelic Venusian woman. And uh, it's interesting that um, it's interesting that this woman spoke to Howard at uh, as she would an adult. So she respected the soul within him, the older soul within him, uh, being Sol Denaro from the, uh, from the Saturnian system. And at this time, she also told him that, um, that um, um, she would, that he would later meet her younger sister, uh, known as Marla on Venus, but that was, uh, Connie Menger, and then when he finally met Connie, he instantly recognized, he had a soul recognition that they were an, a natural couple, that she was a, that she was the Venusian sister, younger sister of this beautiful woman on the rock. So when you look at this, when you look at this picture, uh, you see the typical Venusian scout ship, and this was painted by, by Howard. He was, um, by profession, a sign painter. And uh, this is pretty good. He had great potential there as uh, if he just wanted to be an artist and beautiful rendition here of the, of the Venusian woman. And he was asked by Gray Barker if he would try to uh, do an illustration of the beautiful Venusian woman for the cover of the, his book, which was published in 1959 called From Outer Space to You. And the, this is the, the artwork that appeared on the cover of his first book. So from Venus she came. The young man was so flabbergasted by the encounter that he found himself at a loss for words. But he paid close attention to every word pronounced by the angel, etching them deeply in his mind for future reference. Despite his youth, Howard came to understand that the Venusians were in the process of contacting those they had worked with before on their home world and other planets. The beautiful woman with long blonde tresses and garbed in white flowing shiny robes also explained to the boy that she was over 500 years old and not even considered to be of middle age back on her home world of Venus. She also informed him that Venusians live with nature and not against it, and that this was something Earthlings would have to learn to do if they were going to survive as a species. <clears throat> yeah, another thing, folks, is um, she's shown wearing something, but she cause was she completely naked or like in a see-through gown? Well, um, that was uh, actually written up by. I got the actual notes of the UFO meetings and the clippings from newspapers from the, the mid 1950s when Howard was speaking at the meetings of the uh, 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 North New Jersey uh, 
UFO club in Morristown, New Jersey. And, um, and uh, I'll let the, um, the readers and those interested in, in finding out exactly what was going on there in, uh, in the vast Venus conspiracy in book number four. Yeah. Okay. So that's in the, that's in the actually book number five, Lady Columbus number four, right? Yeah. Number four is um, the vast yeah. Venus conspiracy and Lady Columbus number five. Oh, it's book five. Sorry about that. Right. Anyway, folks. And so it was a little bit um, risque I, for the time. Yeah. It's a little bit risque. So we'll just, they can read it in the book. <laughs> book, book number four, the vast oh. Venus conspiracy. Okay. And this is um, what we could attain to, to the kind of, uh, of paradisical world that the Venusians um, live on. And one day, uh, a thousand years from now, the Earth will be much like Venus as we see Venus today. So uh, Howard Menger turned out to be a war hero with the advent of the Second World War. Menger found employment as a munitions handler at the Picatinny Arsenal in New Jersey. By late 1942, as the war heated up, Menger also signed up as an enlisted man completing Army basic training in El Paso, Texas, whence he was sent to Hawaii and later to Okinawa in a flamethrower unit with the 713th Armored Tank Battalion. Uh, he was injured in battle and temporarily blinded and escaped death on several occasions. So you know that Venusians probably had his back because so many didn't come back from that. And uh, Okinawa, as we know, is the scene of some of the bloodiest fighting in the Pacific Theater of Operations in World War II. Yeah, folks, I was very fortunate enough to meet uh, Howard Menger. I took him to Egypt in 1991 in what was called the 1111 portal with... Um, uh, uh, power places tours i arranged a ufo uh thing we went for 10 days went down the nile and then we uh were in egypt and we went to the great pyramid and all that stuff and i was so fortunate i got to uh sit between colonel wendell stevens on one side and howard and connie directly behind me on the plane so i was in uh ufo heaven in uh, 1991 uh, 60, 70, 80, I think it was like 30 something. So, um, Howard, uh, later on has given me the second copy of the UFO contact from the Pleiades. Billy Meyer has number one, and I'm very fortunate to have book number two. Now, ha Howard, I would call him a, a, a long, tall glass of water. He was pretty tall. And he told me he, he was quite a, um, a scientist, I'm sure Raymond will go into his light information, but he developed a spaceship based on some stuff. And there's another story um, I might add to that a little bit later, but I'm going to let uh, Kaz carry on. So Howard was a very uh, upright gentleman. He wasn't a liar. And Raymond's showing us the human side of the contactees, or as we would call the star seed, how the contacts began and how they move forward here. Go ahead, Kaz. Sorry. It, oh, yeah. It's 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 interesting that uh, many, if not most, of the contactees had some experience in the uh, in the military and traveling to other countries and seeing the rougher parts of the uh, 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 of the world. And I think that was, you know, preparatory uh, their soul to the necessity of doing this important work of uh, of bringing peace on Earth sharing the Venusian message and how life is on the other planets and how it could be on this planet. So World War II served as a harbinger of worsening things to come. It was while he was in the military that his contacts began again with highly advanced beings from other planets of our solar system who warned him of future events that would transpire on Earth. The woman appeared again to Menger while he was stationed in Hawaii and said that wars do not exist on Venus. But even when this war is over, your planet will be in greater danger if the nations of, 
of your world do not stop warring against each other. <clears throat> so this is a this is a you know picture of uh, what could have happened during the Cold War. Um, but I think you know Valiant Thor and other Venusians were working behind the scenes to make sure this didn't happen. And I can't tell you that during the um, above ground testing that was taking place at nuclear facilities and uh, and test areas around the world by both the United States, uh, uh, the Soviet Union and the Chinese, that uh, UFOs were being seen in great numbers there emitting these green fireballs. <clears throat> They were soaking up the radiation to, um, uh, you know, prevent further damage because this above ground testing, if it had gone unchecked by the Venusians and their spacecraft and with the help of other friendly ETs, we would, we would be much more mutated today as a species. So they, they have been on our side helping us all along. The Central Intelligence Agency was also involved. After the war and upon honorable discharge from the military, Menger returned home where the contacts with advanced angelic beings continued. With extraterrestrial craft landing almost continually on his farm in Hart Bridge, it comes as no surprise that he was contacted by agents of the then newly formed Central Intelligence Agency, whence he was assigned a top secret mission Menger and several other witnesses from the North Jew Jersey UFO Club, uh, headed by um, uh, Lee Munsick, who also helped to uh, form NICAP from the former uh, Civilian Saucer Intelligence Group uh, headquartered in New York, were directed to capture some of these landings on 8 millimeter film, and Menger was required to turn over most of that film to the CIA. So I I wanted to uh, ask you, Rob, if, but you know, in your experiences with uh, Howard, if he ever told you um, anything about um, any involvement with the CIA or the government. Yes, um, Howard uh, explained to me. Uh, I believe it was in Pennsylvania at this point. Howard was having uh, experiences, and I think he quickly discerned that the the government was not so friendly towards them, uh, and he was hassled a little bit. So what he told me, and this is a typical kind of story, he told me that he had discovered that gravity is a push as much as a pull, and that there's four poles. I don't really know that much because we've been told so much. Obviously, there is a note in the cathode, but um, what he was given as a vision in high school um, at a certain point in his life, I think it was in the late 40s, he had developed a flying saucer disc, and when he turned it on, um, he didn't have any guidance or control, but he turned it on. And what happened was he said the rotation of the earth, um, it just flew up and out of space. It just took off. And he had a little, it was like a little model, probably, you know, I think he described it like maybe three feet big with some devices in there. And, and it just took off and it, a farmer found it in his field and turned it over to the government. And the government went to the local electronics store and went by the part numbers and where they were and uh, located that store questioning, oh, that's Howard Menger, the, you know, he's, uh, you know, he's, he, I think he was a sign maker and some other things, electric signs, but that's Howard Menger. So they knock on his door and um, they actually get him to, uh, work with him at that point um and uh i think before this actually they had come by and he was starting to talk about his ufo experiences with the public and the cia and the i don't think the national security agency wasn't doing that and of course folks 
as now we now know that those are the really bad guys. Those are called the Black Sun, or the, what the Venusians call the Intruders or the Interlopers, the Fallen Angels, the Anunnaki, the higher dimensionals inside the Earth, who corrupted the Earthly administration and is responsible and pretty much owned the Earth for the last sixteen thousand years. Those covenants, those a thousand of these agreements, and and. Uh, the signatories that actually the galactics have to honor are now null and void and the planets being taken back via Kim Gogan ground command. Now, a lot of people get triggered by that, but I'm going to go back to this story. So Howard said this guy comes up to his house and threatens him and his family. This is with his first wife and says, you're going to be, your family's in danger. <laughs> Howard, um, uh, and I'll finish this story here. It's kind of an interesting story, but so Howard goes, he goes like that. The guy leaves. Howard runs out to his barn, fires up his car and follows that guy all the way to New York. Wow. To a walk up in Brooklyn. And he, he follows the guy up the, you know, the stairs. The guy wasn't so sharp. Howard was actually following the entire way, went upstairs. <laughs> the guy was closing the door, kicked open the door. And there was a guy's wife and his family goes, he says, now I know where you live in your family. So <laughs> Howard was a, a tough SOB, so to speak. So the, the second story, when the government shows up at his house, did you make this? And he gets in for a debriefing and they go, yeah, they go, well, we'd like you to uh, make one for us. And he goes, so he goes, okay. So he wants to do a service to his country. So he drives all the way out to Colorado Springs. And they have an underground base there. He said he spent about a year there. And um, he they had built a, an, a guidance system within there. Um, you know, because it's basically it's basically like a, a magnet and the, the lever kind of leans it forward and the ship tries to catch up to its own thing. I'm not really sure all the technology and they still to this day do not want us to generally have that. Uh, technology, though the government has very exotic technology now, but that's watched very carefully. Um, so he said they they flew it up, and then they it worked, so they made a larger model. And so Howard was intimately involved in this. He said all he wanted was to not have pay taxes and to get a social security check every month for life. And um, so here's this guy giving a year of his time. He had all the plans. And um, so he, they built this thing. He said they took it up to 50,000 feet. Um, this UFO. Um, and uh, hold on just a second here. Hello. Yes, it is. Thank you. I'll be by to pick it up that later. Okay. Sorry, folks. I had to answer that. I left my wallet at the movie theater. They found it. So uh, <laughs> I just wanted to, I had to answer that. So the, he flew it up to 50,000 feet. He said they bought it down. They said, thank you very much. And he was sent home that day. And I go, yeah. So I said, then what happened? He goes, well, I didn't trust him. So uh, while I was driving, I had a a handcuff to my briefcase. He kept all of his original plans and he, and I wonder where they are, but he had the, uh, it was called the, I think they called it the, uh, the X 50 or something like this. I saw a picture of it. Um, and um, so he said he was somewhere like, uh, you know, in, on the way back from uh, Colorado Springs and uh he said uh, there was a, a black, you know, whatever it was at the time, a black Ford or Chevy or something like that. And there was a CIA guy. He was at a gas station out in the middle of nowhere. That was when Goober came out and filled your car. And, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and so he's coming back from the bathroom with his on, on his hand and um, he was walking towards his car uh, and the agent was coming at him with a hypodermic needle wow and i said he said i said howard i said and he goes and he says i looked over at the guy in the car and he opened his uh 
his jacket and showed a gun. I said, Howard, were you scared? This is like the early days of the men in black. And he says, hell no, Rob. I landed at Okinawa. I go, what'd you do? <laughs> I blocked the hypodermic with the briefcase and I kicked the shit out of that. Of the agent. And he looked wow. at the other guy and waved him over and the guy shook his head and he went home and continued on. Oh, so, wow. That's impressive. Very impressive. The, the, the little, the little, uh, I'll call it the, uh, I don't know, whatever it's the, the thought for the day was he went back after he didn't get a paycheck, he was pissed. So went all the way back to Colorado Springs and they had terraformed the entire area. Oh. He couldn't tell where this little building base and the underground thing and everything was, uh, you know, they were building this, this base. I think this was in the fifties. He told me. So uh, the, the, the MIBs and the, I think in the late fifties and early sixties were driving around in, in the, Ford Galaxy 500s. Yeah, so that's what it was. But the yeah, real yeah, that was the car. That was before the extraterrestrial MIBs using the clones and some of the literally non-human uh, inorganic beings that are running around. That's a different story. This is in the early <laughs> days where men in black were actually humans. Um, and that's a whole other discussion for those of you who are interested in this deep, dark cover-up. Well, Rob, so, I'm just kind of curious. What movie did you go see? Uh, some Mission Impossible last night. I also saw oh. some Freedom uh -huh. about government uh, uh, complicity. It, it's it's a light story about uh, child trafficking and how this great agent goes down and saves 120 children from trafficking and makes a sting down in Colombia. Uh, it's horrible. It's going on here. It's going on with politicians. It's going on in our movie industry. And human trafficking is horrible. It'll bring you to tears when you think of the innocent children and their lives ruined. Valiant Thor is very much uh, spoken about this type of thing in his thing. I'll let you continue here. Oh, yes. Well, uh, one of the things that was pointed out in the in the meeting is how Valiant Thor has intervened to help certain individuals. And in my sixth book called um, Flying Saucers and the Venus Legacy. There is a story in there by a professor from Benares University in India. And um, he grew up, he grew up in the slums of Calcutta and Valiant Thor and the Victor One crew rescued him and made, made him a part of their-, their He toured the planets in the solar system and he wrote a book about, uh, in an article about paradisical worlds that was published uh, in the European UFO contact uh, magazine. And um, I had to exchange publications with uh, Hans Peterson, former colonel in the uh, Danish Air Force. And uh, he, he um, put that article uh, in there. So I... Uh, I reprinted it in uh, the book six of the Venus series, if people want to uh, to, to read that. But it, that's one example of a child, um, you know, abuse, a child labor, and everything that was uh, that was rescued by the Venusians. Yeah, Doctor Frank said I think he was found on one of those trash heaps where the homeless uh, children run around there. And uh, well, he had a funny name. What was it like, popcorn or something, or what do they call him? Yeah, it was. Uh, I have his name in there uh, in in the story. Anyway, so uh, he was a uh, Dr. Frank knew him and spoke about him. So now, now he's a prominent u university professor, or I think he's retired now. But uh, he was very prominent in uh, in uh, in in many fields in India. Yes. Um, okay, I'll uh, let you continue because we're going to go a little bit over. We haven't even gotten to our time yet, so we've got another 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, and then, we, yeah, we could continue it. Uh, uh, we could continue it in a series because there's a lot of good information in here. But like many contactees, Menger served as a CIA informant up to a point, and uh, the members of Lee Munsick's UFO Club uh, in New Jersey uh, helped Howard in these efforts, going to different field locations, taking photographs of the spaceships and so forth. 
So this is the day the uh, Venusians came to Highbridge. Uh, these photos were taken by August C. Roberts on Sunday, the 13th of July, 1958. And uh, <clears throat> they are found in my auto binder binder. I call it the auto binder binder and also includes the letter where the legendary astroscience ufologist Otto Binder asked his friend and longtime research associate August C. Roberts of Lee Munsick's North Jersey UFO Club in Morristown for help in compiling photos for a new book that unfortunately never got published. August C. Roberts' comments on each photo were typed on the back by him, but for the sake of convenience, we're just going to use Roberts' own words for the captions. Sometimes my comments appear written in longhand in addition to Robert's explanation in the form of a note for further follow-up in future editions of my Venus books. So here's a, this is a August C. Roberts copy of a book that he was going to write with Otto O. Binder and August C. Roberts. These, this is about, um, eight page, uh, there's an eight page synopsis. This is just the front page, but it was going to include from somewhere to 250 to 300 of Robert's photos, including those pertaining to Howard Menger and Valiant, and Valiant Thor. Yeah, Valiant Thor, uh, uh, Dr. Frank Stranges gave me uh, the actual, um, they were a little Kodachrome slideshow of that i actually have the originals of that meeting from dr frank strange's that augie gave him that um i think he had converted into one of those old carousel i actually have those originals they wouldn't i don't even think they make those kind of uh, slideshows anymore but i have a, a little piece of ufo history there go ahead cos oh that's awesome rob you can get i think you can get those digitized Okay. Maybe. I don't know. It might, if I can find them. Because it's so old. It might. Um, yeah, they're kind of sketchy. But yeah, Otto Binder created the extraterrestrial hybrid hypothesis. And besides uh, being a writer for of science fiction books and comic books, uh, creating comic book stories, he also wrote five books about UFOs. And and several unpublished ones as, um, as well. Is that and, the first Supergirl? Yeah, that's the first one. Do you actually, is that your photograph from your collection? Y yeah, that's the one that I showed you when you were here. Right, so that's the actual one. So uh, that's, that, that's the one I got offered, uh, you know, over $10,000 for that, for that one. Oh, it's nice to know you have a little. Yeah, a little, nest, yeah a little nest egg. <laughs> So um, it's it's in this in my secure storage facility at an undisclosed location. Yeah, undisclosed location. All I could say is that all my UFO files and everything are in the woods. They're deep in the woods in West Virginia. <clears throat> so August C. Roberts was the most well-known UFO photojournalist from the 1950s into the 70s and uh, many of his photos appear in in the books of many UFO authors from his uh, photo gallery. This is a one of the first, this is the very first photo that he took of a UFO, August from the top of the Empire State Building. He went up there with the um, civilian um, uh, sky spotters group Back then in the early 1950s, uh, ufologists and other interested parties were contacted by uh, the federal government through Project Blue Book to do sky watching for unidentified aircraft. And um, he saw this object, uh, a little sphere, uh, bobbing up and down around the Empire State Building uh, and he was standing up on top of there with several other um, interested parties. Dr. Frankie Stranges published the photo. You know, he, he didn't, the object was moving and he couldn't 
hold the camera steady enough to get a picture of it. But uh, Robert's first UFO photo appears in Dr. Frankie Strange's first book and popular book, Flying Saucerama from the Vantage Press in 1959. And I should add there that um, when I went to Sturgeon Bay, Wisconsin, and uh, was it, uh, I took a little side trip after uh, going to Bill Benson's UFO Days, D-A-Z-E, at Campbellsport, at the, um, at the, uh, uh, he has a little bar out there and held uh, UFO conferences every year out there at Long, Long Lake, Wisconsin. I took a little trip up to Sturgeon Bay to research the beginnings of APRO. And it turns out that Coral and Jim Lorenzen were also contacted to be sky watchers, uh, airplane spotters of unidentified, you know, aircraft uh, by Project Blue Book as well in 1952, when Project Blue Book was formed and when Coral and Jim Lorenzen formed APRO. Now, I have a lot of information from APRO in my books because I was a member of that group and um, and uh, Dr. Leo Sprinkle uh, from the uh, University of Wyoming, uh, he did the uh, introduction to my first Venus book, uh, Venus Rising. And he was uh, the first scientific consultant to uh, to APRO. So here's a tip off to the memorable Highbridge, New Jersey Flying Saucer Club meeting. Dr. Frankie Stranges in the photo on the right informed Howard Menger that Venusian Commander Valiant Thor and his contingent would be in attendance at his next Highbridge Flying Saucer Club meeting on the 13th of July, 1958 arriving in the guise of journalists from South Africa. Menger, in turn, invited Roberts and other members of the Morristown, New Jersey UFO group to attend the meeting and asked Roberts in particular to take photos of everyone showing up that day <clears throat> for later identification by Reverend Dr. Stranges, who met Valiant Thor earlier, a few months earlier in the Pentagon, um, in the Pentagon back in 1957. So um, Dr. Stranges would easily be able to identify uh, Valiant Thor and any other, uh, any other Venusians. And so more details of that are in my Venus Rising book. Uh, photojournalist August C. Roberts photographs of the memorable Valiant Thor meeting along with his official seal and type comments as to what happened when each photo was taken. <clears throat> Here's Howard looking really cool with his Ray-Bans. And uh, this is on his property on the day of the, on the, day of the meeting. Uh, here's August C. Roberts' seal. He said, Howard Menger, photo is a large blow up of a part of a negative. This is the only photo I have of Howard showing a close-up. This is Howard with his first wife, Rose. At that meeting, on the meeting that day, Howard was giving a talk and Valiant Thor was taking notes about what Howard was saying. Howard Menger and his wife speaking to a group outside their home at Highbridge, New Jersey. This is in the backyard in their apple orchard. Their house is right across from an ice cream parlor that's still there today. Here's another, another one of Howard, and you see it. I don't know. It looks like a. Yeah, like, let's. We can go. Let's go to the next one. Let's get to Val. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. I want you to be late. All right. This is one of the Tharp sisters, uh, standing on a point, where um, the the woman appeared in the backyard. Uh, Howard's house. Marianne Tharp at the location Howard claimed as others in the group did that the spaceman, i.e. Valiant Thor, jumped over the bushes and fence a total of about 15 feet across. So if there was any doubt that they were from another planet, um, it was certainly remarkable that with the suits 
and all the clothes that they were wearing that they could jump over a 15 foot fence. A 15 foot wide or 15 foot high? Uh, 15 foot high. Yeah. High. It's just a little small. Yeah, yeah they're definitely, de definitely extraterrestrials. And here's some, um, Here's Howard inside of his house on that evening. They gave in the evening after the meeting where Val Thor appeared, um, even more, more people began to show up and he took them on a tour of his house and every room was filled. You see the TV in the background, the old fashioned TV, you know, when we could only get like three channels, ABC, NBC, and CBS. We had all, and we had only those three channels, but there's always something interesting to watch. Now we have hundreds of channels and really nothing, nothing. interesting to watch. Okay, next. <laughs> okay, this is at his home in Highbridge. Um, this is as people started to show up. And then you see here on the right side. This is Jill and Don. Jill and Don. Uh -huh. And then that looks like Tanya over there. Yeah. And these other people are um these other people are members from the High Bridge uh or no from the Morristown um UFO club that were starting to show up. Okay, here's a here's a view of uh, the whole party. And that, and then here's Valiant Thor. Um can you see the arrow here? This my arrow. It's yeah, yeah. Your cursor. We see it. Yeah. Oh, okay. That that's Valiant Thor there. He's starting to take notes. There's Don and Jill. I've met all three of them, folks. This is part of a group who came to hear Howard Menger speak of his contact claims at his home in Highbridge. Then later on in the night, after it got dark, they held a sky watch. This is his son, Eric, who is then uh, uh, 10 or 12 years old, somewhere in between there. He passed away, but he said that he saw a, a mothership, large cigar-shaped craft, pass over the house. And you know, at any UFO event, there's always a party pooper. And... Uh, Bob Stevens, who also spotted the same object as the boy, claimed it was nothing more than a shooting star. And then it says, see the text. I have the text and uh, could share that. Um, yeah, okay. That later. Um, okay, so these are some of the photos taken by Howard, as well as other members of the... Um, uh, of the Morristown UFO Club that went out on sky watches. You see the the one at, at the top here, standing alone, has a has a UFO occupant in front of the mothership, disembarking from, I mean the scout ship, yeah. disembarking from the scout ship. And then here's the small pad that I later was able to get hold of that had notes about George Adamski and George Hunt Williamson. That was uh, also with Valiant Thor that he took those notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, let's just go through the next picture, Cos. Oh, okay. So okay. this is the small foot book, you know, that talks about George Hunt Williamson and, uh, and encrypted comments regarding the first contact with Orthon by George Adamski. And uh, more, more of the small notebooks. Valiant Thor marvels. Note the question mark. How Williamson might think or publicly say that Orthon is a male. Further cryptic writing punctuated to possibly indicate tongue click insertion. So they heard them, the party speaking a South African indigenous click language. Uh, according to Roberts and some others on the scene. Um, th this was so, and um, Dr. Frankie Stranges was very fascinated by a case in South Africa of a woman named Elizabeth Clare, and she said that there was a huge saucer base underneath 
the Drakensberg mountain range, which is where her ranch was uh, located. So there's a big South African connection with, um, with Valiant Thor and some of the Euphonauts. This is inside Howard's home down in the basement. And um, every room in his house was crowded that night as he took people on a tour. This is Mary Ann Tharp uh, at a location where she saw a thought disc while, while with a group with Howard Menger. So the thought discs are little tiny saucers, maybe like a foot or a foot and a half across that are dispatched to monitor the thoughts of people, their intentions, before they actually let a scout craft come in the area and they dispatch or dispatch any Venusians in the area. Okay, Next, there, there we go. Next, we got Ma Marianne at her and her friend uh, at the spot where Howard met the space woman. And uh, okay. Then here we see uh, here we see Valiant Thor. This is the this is the original picture, right here. You see the. I don't know, like a pompadour kind of real cream look there. <laughs> From the 50s, they were really into those clothes, yeah. Uh, there's Jill and Vice Commander Don between Jill and Valiant Thor. Mm -hmm. And um, on the left to right, the woman and, and man next to her were the ones who gave Howard Menger and his wife Rose the eight-hand handshake. So the text describes that. It's kind of like the Masons and other societies might have a secret handshake. Or... Oh, show us what it looks like, Cos. Well, it's um it, it's described in the text. So So let, let, let's see it. The text. I want to see what the eight hand handshake is. Oh, okay. Well, we're we're gonna to get to the text. So Okay. Uh, but if not today, definitely in the follow up program. Um, August C. Roberts' re uh, reporting letter of 24 July 1958 to Gray Barker of the Saucerian Press concerning the proceedings of the meeting. So you see, this is on uh, this is on uh, August C. Roberts stationery, um, July 28th, 1952 is the emblem here of the spherical object that have, was near the Empire State Building that he took a picture of. And then the the move, the, it's actually dated um, July 24th. And then here it talks about, it was July 13th, 1958, a Sunday, that uh, he actually went out there uh, to attend the meeting where Valiant Thor showed up. And this is his account of everything that happened. And uh, then uh, August C. Roberts wrote it up. He wrote the whole story up. And um, it comes to 13 pages, 13 type pages. And uh, it was, uh, you know, it was edited by him for publication, but it never got published. 13 pages altogether. It also includes uh, Dr. Frankie Strange's account and how he got involved with uh, Valiant Thor as it was told by him to August C. Roberts to make a complete report. So the man on the right, uh, who is Howard Menger, is plain was a man from the planet Venus, the man and woman next to him were the two who gave Howard Menger and his and his wife Rose the odd type of eight hand handshake. Well, that was so we we see here several different pictures of uh, Valiant Thor with the notepad and. Uh, he was transcribing from the meeting and the talk given by Howard Menger. Longhand comments 
by Val Thor regarding Williamson's speculation on early mankind and alien influence impressed by keen mind and insight of rocketeer Willie Lay to find out the seven line pad pages contained, please read Flying Saucers from Venus They Come or C. Then I posted them all on rents. So you could see. These are Howard, uh, these are um, Valiant Thor's notes of Howard Menger. Kind of faded with age. They talk about missing villages, missing Eskimo villages. Every Inuit was gone without a trace. The famous rocketeer, Willie Lay, and uh, and uh, and many others. So you could go to rents.com, follow down on the right side of the page, and you could see all the the notes um, of Valiant Thor. Here's the uh, here's the first page talking about the Rocketeer Willie Lay, and um, some other uh, an incident in California with uh, I think this was uh, a disappearing uh, a, an an individual that disappeared out in the desert there. Okay, so um, how are we doing for time? Uh, how are we doing for time, Rob? Hello? Um, well, thank Hello? you as well, so it's all good. Go ahead, uh, go ahead, Kaz. Oh, oh okay. Um, yeah, how are we doing for time? For sure. Okay, I got to go. I got to go, Kevin. Bye. Yeah, go ahead, Kaz. Sorry. Uh, oh, okay. Um, I got a call from before, Gavin there. I was just, <laughs> just chatting. So did you finish oh, okay. that up? Um, well, I got to the point about introducing Connie Menger. And I think uh, what we can do is um, there's a lot of information about Connie's connection, especially out with um, California and um, George Van Tassel, Daniel Fry and everything that I would like to share. And um, the nature of um, ascended masters and uh, transmogrification and everything. This is really awesome stuff. And I think we should continue uh, before getting into that, which is really deep, we should um, uh, do that on the next meeting. Okay, that sounds good. All right, folks, there you have it, Raymond. You see how how well researched he he is he he goes into the details of the contactees he has guided or given or somehow clandestinely receiving special documentation showing that all of the contactees in the 50s from giant rock almost all of them were from venus this is these are our guardian sister planet they're the ones who have the purview over earth and any et that comes here has to go through the Venusian hierarchy of life. Is that correct, Kaz? Uh, yes, that is right. And uh, as myself, as the uh, Venus historian, was able to have access to all the main documents and personal data and information for all the contactees of the 1950s and even some of the minor ones. Okay, folks. So this is going to go. Nelson, Daniel Fry, George Adamski, Howard Menger, all of them. Yeah, I saw Daniel Fry and, and uh, Frank Stranges in the late 70s at the UFO thing. We went to the same uh, diner, not the International House of Pancakes, but a different one. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to offer, I think we'll offer any three of Raymond's books for $56 to include shipping. And the entire set of nine books, including shipping, Raymond is offering for $160. You're going to have everything you need to know. And you'll be able to, if you study these books or look at them, it's a lot of books, but it's so fascinating. So much is revealed in these books. Um, you can give them away as gifts. And um, 
They're amazing books. So I, they're all available on my website. You can also get them on Amazon, but Raymond gets a little more uh, compensation when you buy through me. So I'm going to put those um, three books um, for sale at $60 special. And all nine of his books are going to be available in a package deal for $160. This is in the continental United States. Now, um, I may call, depending on, uh, you're not going to want them internationally these days, folks. One of his Venus Rising books, Canada is Ridiculous, uh, $40. So the government is uh, doing a lot of uh, stealing and the customs fees there. But uh, I, I don't know about Hawaii. Probably we could do it. I'm not sure what media mail. I think media mail works in Hawaii. Yeah, media, media mail go to Hawaii. And then so, uh, for the people overseas, uh, working out something with headline books where they can uh, where they can get ebooks for for all of the uh, for all of the books. And uh, as soon as I get um, get uh, uh, a package on that with a with a QR, is it a QR code or something? QR code, yeah. It's, it's going to be in a. I think that's something called the issue or something, but it's going to be like a Kindle folks. So uh, we're going to see cause again. Uh, we're going to do it. We're going to, I'm going to start hunkering down and I'm also going to be, I've been finally given permission after much hounding of Valiant Thor and uh, the angel force that Dr. Frank Strange has told me none of his inner circles were actually copyrighted. And he told me, he said, Rob, you can share my information with anyone but you must describe it to me these are the secret inner circle meetings that dr frank stranges would not reveal to the public because they were so far out there but i feel people deserve the truth the venusians say don't cast pearls before swine to a certain extent with mass media today i feel like let's cast the pearls out let the swine wallow in the mud and regurgitate and not accept the information, but let those who have ears to hear um, absorb this information. I have redacted from playing in public any further of the Commander Or Rain's video files. Her Earth identity was discovered. And if anyone doesn't think a Venusian uh, with their technology, their superpowers <laughs> to us, their natural God-given gifts on display um, can't avoid uh, being captured or cornered. Um, they're mistaken. Even if you figured out who uh, the Earth life is or where they're located in whatever country uh, they reside in doing their mission, you would walk into a room with them and you would never see them. They would be standing right there and you wouldn't notice them. Valiant Thor on many occasions, and Dr. Frank Strange has told me on many occasions where uh, him and Don were at the White House and uh, in, a, in a meeting, and Jimmy Carter came up to, to them and looked at their left shoulder, and he goes, "Where you guys are interesting characters. Where are you from? He said, Jimmy Carter looked closely at uh, Dr. Frank Strange's the. Uh, thing and there was nothing there and he said state department huh so <laughs> um valiant thor is also when dr frank strange's was has was attempted to be murdered on four different occasions um walked in uh, on i know of two occasions where he walked into the hospital where dr frank was and he um um told the doctors, you can leave now. And all the doctors around an emergency case just walked out of the room. Valiant Thor put his hand on his head, looked to the heavens and prayed. And Valiant Thor got up and walked out past the ambulance guys that bought him in on a stretcher. His neck was broken. So, so just rest assured that Valiant Thor and these the Venusian Angel Force do have spiritual gifts uh, that they're able to use to live here. So the, the fact that I, I'm covering up uh, Commander Aura Reigns, the moon base, the beautiful moon base commander on Earth, um, who has uh, various more public than most Venusians activities, um, 
are able to walk and talk amongst you and beware lest she entertain angels unaware because they're here. Thank you, Rob, for that message. That's Thank you, Paz. Important message. And we'll have more to share in the coming weeks about the first, the first uh, three uh, Venus books. And uh, you're going to like um, when we get to, when we get around to uh, final countdown rockets to Venus, uh, one of the people that I interviewed to get some information in there about the Sirius star system um, has provided some outstanding data, which we are going to share with you that you probably haven't uh, haven't heard of, but you'll be astounded and very appreciative of it, I'm sure. Yeah, very good. Um, all right, Kaz, um, I'm going to stay on the line. I'm going to ask you to... Uh, I want to get a hold of, um, I want to say his name is Cotton or the, the Indian professor. I want to see if I can find him and reach out to him. Oh, oh, okay, sure. All right. Okay. Thanks, folks. Uh, victory to the light. Things are moving along. I'm going to be revealing, uh, which, oh, by the way, for those of you who are watching, I've been trying to get the recordings of my conference and the the film the videographer has had some problems. A wonderful guy, Dennis Whipple, um, but um, it's a lot of effort to do that. And uh, I've tried every year. I've never really received the recordings of them. I, I did one year, but so if he doesn't do them, we're not going to be videotaping <laughs> um, next year. I'm only going to be doing the recordings. But if we can get that, I'm going to get that. It's going to be uh, we're going to put them up, and they're going to be in a private file, and we'll try to. Um, charge a very low fee for that so you can listen to every speaker at the conference okay all right thank you folks god bless you victory to the light and thank you raymond keller i'll uh, let you guys go now and keep it keep your eyes on the prize if you're interested come see us in english and don't worry we're going to be explaining the space jesus soon and it's going to be hard i've given the gospel of thomas to several devout christians and unfortunately the programming is just too deep. They can't accept, G if he's a creator of the universe, the living word of God, I mean, uh, space people, they just, their minds just, their eyes go fuzzy, window shades of disbelief come down, and they can't circumnavigate the reality of the multidimensional nature of the universe. But I know there's a lot of people out there who are ready to understand the truth of our heavenly angels and the true position of the earth in the cosmos and its relationship to the great fall of the in this universe and the liberation of this universe earth plays a a very unique role as revealed Rob, we, by we many even have a we even have a photo in um uh, uh, we even have a photo we can show them uh, the next time that of uh of uh, a painting on board uh, an interplanetary spaceship of Jesus. What's what what painting is that? That's the one that's uh, that I had in Mount Shasta when we were doing the the gospel readings. Oh, that's on board a spaceship. Yeah, that was on board a spaceship. Oh my God, folks! All right. Also, we have Sister Thedra took a photograph of Christ at Chichen Itza, where he used to. Uh, uh, appear down there. He was called Cuculcan down there in Mexico uh, City. He was called Quetzalcoatl, and he was called Tacoma. He was also known as Hiawatha. Uh, is that Hiawatha? Was that his name? No, uh, it was. Um, but the other ones were, were rang a bell there. Quetzalcoatl and uh, yeah, he he did walk the Americas. I think Viracocha might be another name. Viracocha, yeah. So he was appearing Viracocha, yeah. throughout uh, throughout the the South American and American, and probably all over the world. He also went inside the interdimensional levels of the Earth and freed a lot of the trapped souls from the Anunnaki fallen angels. Another story, folks, a little deeper, but have faith. We're getting there. All right, I'm going to stop this meeting, folks, and check in next week. And uh, I will be having a, an email coming out on the report. I'm going to probably uh, put a couple of these interviews with Raymond in there. So I have some new information. All right, folks. Victory to the light. And thank you, Cosmo. Victory in the light. Ciao for now. <laughs>